here's where we get to the really interesting part. I started doing research on Parkinson's disease when the first person contacted me many, many years ago um, asking for help. And so I knew what it was. I mean, I studied this in school. I knew that the prognosis was pretty awful. Um, the only thing that I ever learned about really was that these people take drugs until they don't work anymore. And then Parkinson's patients live out their life in some type of uh, care home, usually, because it becomes almost impossible to take care of them at a certain point in time. And um, it's not unlike an Alzheimer's patient where the family has um, uh, just an incredible burden to take care of the person and it becomes unbearable after a period of time. Uh, so I wanted to look at this from an alternative point of view. I always assume that there's something out there that hasn't been discovered yet. And if we research enough, we can find it. So um, what I found, and I'm going to share with you on these next few slides, is that Parkinson's disease, we don't know if it's an autoimmune disease, but it shares a lot of features with autoimmune disease. And why that becomes really important is that we know a lot about how to help autoimmune patients um, who, uh, with diet and lifestyle choices and uh, water fasting. I mean, I've, I've done lectures at this conference on autoimmune disease. And I think that um, it's a, a lot of work um, uh, to, to do all the things that you need to do to maintain function and keep autoimmune diseases from progressing. But, um, but it's worth doing because it limits the disability factor. Well, if Parkinson's disease actually is an autoimmune disease, or we even uh, suspect that it is, this opens up a whole lot of uh, treatment options that I'll share with you. All right, so the first thing is inflammation. High levels of inflammation are present in PD patients in the periphery and in the brain. Autoreactive, and that, that's a feature of autoimmunity, uh, T lymphocytes, autoantigens, and microglial um, uh, activation are present. And um, so inflammation and autoimmunity may be important contributing causes. And I actually found quite a bit of research that talks about this. So it's known for 30 years that inflammation is present in the brains of Parkinson's patients. Now it's considered a likely contributing cause and related to the progression. So Reset and, and uh, his research team looked at patients with and without Parkinson's and the patients who had been prescribed two classes of immunosuppressant drugs had a lower risk of developing Parkinson's disease. And the two of them were um, corticosteroids and inosine monophosphate dehydrogenase inhibitors. That's a mouthful, right? Well, the important thing is that these are two classes of drugs that are used to treat autoimmune patients. And patients who had been prescribed either or both of these classes of drugs had a lower risk. So that doesn't mean that Parkinson's is an autoimmune disease, but what we try to do is say, okay, let's just look at all the things that possibly point in that direction. Let's see how they stack up. So just keep that in mind. All right, here's another thing. Fats damage the blood brain barrier. Now, not all fat. And I mean, in other words, you need some dietary fat, but we live in a, in a society right now in westernized countries where you don't, people are almost on a ketogenic diet just by virtue of the fat that's in their daily diet. Um, so if you consume too much fat, you damage, you have the potential to damage the blood brain barrier. And this is one of the mechanisms of action that can lead to multiple sclerosis. This allows antibodies to enter the cerebrospinal fluid and attack brain cells. We refer to it as molecular mimicry. And I'm going to come back to that and explain it a little more in depth. Molecular mimicry, by the way, is a factor in many autoimmune diseases. So um, it, the amino acids in dairy uh, that make up the proteins in dairy um, have been shown to contribute to autoimmune diseases like juvenile diabetes. And the way that this works is that um, when you have a broken blood brain barrier, a broken um, gastrointestinal leaky gut, um, you, you end up with antigens crossing these barriers and in the gut, uh, undigested dairy proteins, for example, the amino acid chains that make up those dairy proteins look like the amino acid chains that make up the beta cells and the pancreas that produce insulin. And so the antibodies that go after those dairy proteins uh, can go after those beta cells. Uh, the same thing is true with the amino acid chains and gluten. 
uh, which are related to uh, thyroid autoimmune disease like Hashimoto's or Graves' disease. Um, so the idea that protein fragments could be related to Parkinson's disease is not a crazy idea at all. We know that molecular mimicry is a factor in many autoimmune diseases. In fact, one group concluded autoimmunity is actively involved in the pathogenesis of Parkinson's disease through several proteins, and they list them here, and then furthermore, a detailed analysis of the relevance of autoimmunity to the uh, clinical symptoms of PD provides strong evidence for the close correlation of autoimmunity with PD. So again, this isn't proof positive, but you know, this, there's more out there. There's more, more research teams looking at this uh, than you might imagine. And I've never met, by the way, a Parkinson's patient who has ever consulted with a doctor of any type, including naturopaths, who has suggested, you know what, maybe we should look at this as an autoimmune disease because it opens up a whole plethora of things that we might be able to do to help you that might not be thought of otherwise. Um, so for a long time, autoimmune disease was ruled out due to the assumption that brain cells were protected uh, from immune system attack. I mean, autoimmunity means that the immune system cannot any longer differentiate self as in your body um, from non-self as in foreign agents coming into the body like undigested food fragments or bacteria or viruses. Um, but the reason this was thought to be the case that, that uh, autoimmune could not be associated with PD or PD could not be uh, an autoimmune disease is that uh, it was thought that most neurons don't have antigens or markers used by immune cells to identify a target. But um, in 2017, a research group at Columbia University did discover that there are antigens on neurons that produce the, the neurons that produce dopamine. Um, this was discovered in postmortem tissue samples. And um, this team has conducted blood tests which show that people with Parkinson's disease mount immune response to these antigens. People with Park without Parkinson's disease don't. And that may go to um, a couple of reasons why this affects some people and not others. One is genetic predisposition, which by the way, is a very minor part of this, but it bears mentioning. And the other may be uh, other comorbidities. In other words, um, we'll talk about some of the risk factors for autoimmune slash PD. And you'll see that a lot of people in the United States and in westernized countries have high, a lot of risk factors for autoimmune and Parkinson's disease by virtue of their diet and lifestyle habits. Um, I've mentioned this a couple of times that constipation is associated with a higher risk of Parkinson's disease and it often precedes it by as much as 10 years. Now we live in a constipated society. I haven't watched television for a couple of years, but I remember back in the day when I used to watch the news, I don't think I ever watched a news program where there wasn't at least one commercial for a laxative, right? So um, there is a correlation between worsening constipation and uh, the progression of Parkinson's disease. Now I mentioned this before about leaky gut. Um, constipation um, can result in leaky gut where, the, where the, um, the microbiome and the tight junctions that allow for a solvent drag to take nutrients into the bloodstream and also provide a barrier system to keep things out of the bloodstream uh, becomes compromised. So uh, constipation is a factor in that. And it's a major contributing factor to autoimmune, which is again, a common denominator um, so that with uh, Parkinson's disease. Um, the mucosal and fecal microbiota are different in Parkinson's patients than controls. There are less bacteria that produce anti-inflammatory substances like butyrate, more pathogenic bacteria. And this could trigger inflammation-induced misfolding of a neuronal protein in the development of Parkinson's disease. Uh, so a consistent characteristic of Parkinson's disease is intestinal permeability. A consistent characteristic in AID is uh, intestinal permeability as well. Another thing that's interesting, um, that there's such a relationship between the gut and autoimmune and the gut and PD, um, specific bacterial profiles are associated with PD and severity of symptoms. In other words, you can look at the microbiome of a Parkinson's patient and you will see a very specific fingerprint. It, it's a good way to look at it in the microbiome. And um, there's significant sensitivity for matching a fingerprint in the microbiome and Parkinson's disease. Um, there are levels of four bacterial families and the severity of constipation were able to identify 
Parkinson's patients with 66.7% sensitivity and 90.3% specificity, the fingerprint of the microbiome and the severity of constipation. So again, um, it looks more and more like an autoimmune disease. And again, the only reason why we might want to term it that is that it opens up treatment options. When germ-free mice were implanted with microbiomes from Parkinson's patients, motor function worsened, another clue that the microbiome is involved. Some studies show that this protein deposition begins in the gut and travels throughout the body via the vagus nerve and the um, uh, central nervous system due to a breach in the blood-brain barrier, again, a characteristic feature of particularly multiple sclerosis and autoimmune disease. Uh, ASIN has been found, this protein has been found in the nerve fibers of the colon in early stage untreated Parkinson's patients, but it's not present in healthy controls. Intestinal inflammation is common in PD patients with increased levels of pro-inflammatory cytokines. These inflammatory markers are correlated with disease progression. Remember, inflammation is a factor in every disease. And by the way, one of the biggest contributing factors to inflammation in westernized countries is being overweight or obese because your fat cells actually pump out inflammatory cytokines. So the reason why you wanna pay attention to weight as a way, means of preventing disease as much as anything else. Constipated PD patients have higher levels of infl inflammatory markers than PD patients without constipation. So it seems that a history of constipation and constipation throughout the course of the disease are major factors for how severe and how fast the disease progresses. Now, this is really interesting. Inflammatory bowel disease is, a, um, uh, is an autoimmune disease. And the terms you're used to hearing are Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, the two major categories. Um, IBD patients have a higher risk of developing Parkinson's disease than people without IBD. Now, one of the hallmark features of autoimmune diseases is if you have one, you're likely to develop more of them if you don't do something to stop the progression of the first disease and address the causes, right? So the idea that an IBD patient has a higher risk of developing Parkinson's, again, it's just building that base of information that tells us maybe this really is autoimmune. So it's an important area of research. It's not medically confirmed. And I didn't show you all of my slides. I mean, I have a whole course on Parkinson's disease. So um, we would have been here till morning if we went through the next morning, if we went through all that stuff. So I tried to just highlight some of this, but the importance of this from my perspective is we know a lot more about autoimmune and how to treat it than we do Parkinson's. And we know that diet and lifestyle change can be very effective for slowing or stopping the progression of AID and reducing the, the uh, risk that you will develop a second autoimmune diseases, or even in some cases, we've even seen autoimmune conditions go away, if the, particularly if the intervention is early enough. And there is no risk associated with treating Parkinson's patients with the same diet and lifestyle pro, pro, uh, protocols as AID. I mean, the things that I recommend to people and, and, and those range from diet change, exercise, et cetera, and also how to have better and more constructive conversations with your doctor, because that's always a good idea, but nobody gets worse from eating more vegetables. Nobody gets worse from taking off 50 extra pounds. People do not get worse when they start exercising. They don't get worse when they drink more water and they sleep better and that sort of thing. So there's nothing to be lost by taking this approach to Parkinson's. Mm -hmm.